Will there be any jobs in the future? We keep hearing about AI, robots, automation, many other things like that. And sometimes we wonder, will there be any jobs, especially in manufacturing in the future? And will we ever live in places other than the earth in our solar system or even beyond? Welcome to Future 39 with John Goods here. Today, we're talking about the future of work and life in the solar system with Kate Levchuk. So let me bring her in right now. Hello, Kate. Hello, John. Great to hear you. Excellent. Our guest today, Kate, is an exec at Infosys. She's a futurist. She's a consultant. She's an author, a researcher, and has a master's degree in two disciplines. Kate, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much for having me. Wonderful. So let's start here. <clears throat> 30 years ago, Harvard Business School prof Shoshana Zuboff said that everything that can be automated will be automated. Do you agree with that? Uh, that's a very strong statement. And at the same time, I think it's a very pragmatic one. So uh, obviously, we need to look at the cost benefit factor here. And if the jobs will be cheaper off being automated, especially in the shorter run, because uh, many executives and politicians, everyone tends to look at things short term. So if ROI is good in up to five years, I think these jobs will be automated for sure. However, it's interesting, we would expect to have so much automation already now in fields like driving or even manufacturing, you were mentioning, like Amazon. But I think it's only about 15 to 20 percent of this packaging things that are automated in Amazon. So it really shows us how much cheaper the people's labor is still. So um, it's, um, I think, definitely in a very short time, um, machines, you know, Moore's law will get uh, to the situation when uh, machines will be really cheap and then especially in developed countries, it will make so much more sense than having people do the work. Let's talk about that timeline a little bit. So if we look at the scope of history, we see a time in the past, the Iron Age, Bronze Age, even before Stone Age, uh, nothing was automated, right? Everything that you wanted to do, a human had to actually physically do. Uh, and and the, the, the only machines that they may have had was something like a bow and arrow or a spear a spear or maybe a, a lever, uh, you know, which can only be labeled a machine with a, a very liberal definition there. Uh, but if we look into the far future as well, we see a future that's completely or, or, or mostly automated and we have manufacturing processes with robotics and automation. Where would you place us right now on that kind of um, scale? Mm. Yeah, that I, I'm already picturing some um, uh, some timeline, and I don't really see us coming to the end of the automation timeline. Uh, I think we are now probably like in all the history you mentioned, we are very close to the end. But in terms of our lifetime, we are still pretty far. So uh, I think the full automation. Uh, which means like probably 70, 80% of jobs of current roles that exist uh, in the market, I think they will be automated in developed countries in the next 15, 20 years, uh, taken the advances in technology and especially robotics. However, um, I do expect that because of that, um, not despite, there will be so many more roles being created, like, for example, those that will have to actually um, program all the robotics and the ones that would have to deal with people, with huge numbers of people who find themselves outside of job market. So something like uh, mood programmers, psychologists, hobby creators, you know, the VR games creators. So all the fun creative professions that will have to deal with those people will also be newly created. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that uh, we are coming to a very interesting point in history where we will see jobs that we talk about only in sci-fi novels today. Can you give some examples of those? Um, well, 
first of all, I think um, there will be a huge need for various kinds of engineering uh, jobs, like especially civil engineering. So some people that would be creating dumps, that would be creating the floating um, constructions because of the climate change and the rise in seawaters. So that would be a whole new uh, industry. I envision um, some manufacturing um, jobs being created in air purification um, sector, for example, uh, there can be even the huge walls around specific uh, place, like let's say whoever has a lot of money, let's say Apple, um, Apple City, and, <laughs> and <laughs> they, they have trillions, so they might as well create uh, the um, air pu purification walls around the city and there will be definitely a company that will be creating these walls because they already have the expertise in let's say air purification ac and uh, discovering new materials i think the whole new industry will be coming from uh, finding out new materials on the earth as well as bringing new ones from space so let's say my, mining uh, meteors and this kind of things We'll need to uh, create new habitats because the population will be changing drastically. There will be way more poor people. So we'll need to create some sustainable and possible living environments for them, like moving away from favelas, for example. Mm -hmm. And people would also want to live in some healthy, uh, clear and clean areas, so we would be seeing uh, the creation of something more like Elysiums, maybe in space or some places on Earth. So New Zealand is a very popular um, natural Elysium area. Um, and yeah, I would say tons of these similar jobs like 3D printing, creating these floating structures on water, um, maybe from trash, because we have tons of that. Um, trash yeah. is the new resource. Trash, uh, yeah, I think trash could be used quite wisely if there is a good segregation uh, possibility, as well as maybe possibly three D printing will be become will become so cheap to mm -hmm. actually create something from all this plastic that we have on Earth, anyways. That's interesting, actually. I mean, let's talk about that. Uh, let's say that we have a future where manufacturing is mostly or or completely automated 3d printing is 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 widespread and and inexpensive uh for multiple forms of materials not just plastics but also metals we see that right now spacex uh 3d prints uh rocket nozzles for instance right you can't get a part that needs more um strength and tensile durability and all those other things than than, than rocket nozzles but we get to a future where that is cheap and readily available what's that do to economies what's that do to uh international trade oh that's a that's a good question i think that um um so again let's go back to short-term versus long-term thinking and i think countries and leaders that really have the long-term thinking for this or other reason then can see into the future in 20 or 30 years and that's why some uh, companies or leaders are actually spending tons of money for futuristic consultancy having the focus groups and understanding what would be the need taking various different factors in 20 30 years those countries will come up with the solutions and start preparing for them right now when most of us are talking about the new apps on the iPhone <laughs> And they will take the leadership. So, of course, I can really see uh, China as one of these um, uh, contenders for the leadership in manufacturing, not only because they have so, so many resources, but also they have um, a good experience doing that. And um, I think they have the, the largest uh, gold reserves. They don't... Um, um, rely on anyone else to do this uh, this type of uh trial and fail and i'm pretty sure that um, 
there are so many initiatives that we don't even know are happening. Like even a few years ago, there was um, a discussion that they're building huge cities somewhere in uh, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, why are they building that? No one knows. They're still empty. So lots of things are happening there and they have huge capabilities for that. So hopefully West will not be too far away. China is also uh, one of um, on the forefront in investing in robotics as well, and uh, having um, um, factories that are heavily uh, roboticized. We see some other economies like that. Germany um, has a high percentage of robots per uh, thousand workers. That sort of thing. A few other economies like that as well. I imagine that as we see economies having a higher and higher percentage of robots to workers, we're going to need to see some some changes in how we tax labor, perhaps. Um, uh, Bill Gates has talked about taxing robots for work that they do. Um, you talked about uh, people um, in the future as, as the, perhaps there are fewer jobs, at least in manufacturing and new different types of jobs that come out. Uh, and you talked about a future there are more poor people. That's obviously not the Star Trek future that we've kind of been uh, hoping for, looking for this future where more people are happy. We don't really work for a salary. There's kind of a credit system, but we kind of graduate and find the niche that 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 fits what we do, and we really really enjoy it. I mean, I still hope. Obviously, that's that's perhaps utopian. I still hope that in a future where most manufacturing jobs are at least the physical manufacturing is automated. Uh, there's still an opportunity for people to have creative jobs. There's still an opportunity for people to have service jobs. There's still an opportunity for people to um, uh, do something and contribute something, whether that's artistically or or otherwise, right? And 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 not have to and have us have a society set up in such a way that you know what you don't have to work those forty hours a week. You don't have to work those fifty hours a week. Maybe you don't even have to work those twenty hours a week. Maybe ten hours a week is enough and you've actually then um, generated some 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 revenue and and and, and are able to sustain yourself and your family uh, but that the cost of living goes down we, we we looked at that for so many so many uh generations right i mean things uh people used to work from the the moment the the sun uh, rose to the to, to when it, the sun set right the 18th century automation um and and factories in in the uk and i'm hoping that we get to a point where um, our labor matters and our labor isn't just what we can do with our hands, but it's what we can do with our minds and our emotions. Yeah, that's uh, very true, John. And actually, um, talking about uh, what you mentioned as um, people used to work so much more and now it's actually better. I do agree that it's better in terms of um, worker unions that be were created, the elimination of child labor and all this slavery but actually if we look very much back in history we can notice that um, during hunter gatherers period people worked much less and it just all depends on the quality and level of life you want so um the reason why i'm saying there can be more poor people as well as more rich people as we see in inequality charts increasing now is simply because if we continue with business as usual, there will be much more people on the planet. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we will have more resources. So obviously we will have, um, we will need to provide for people who lost their, their jobs to manufacturing and robotics. So that will I think some some kind of social welfare system like UBI uh, will be easily uh, will be able to do. Uh, but um, I envision a tons of uh, new possibilities for people who will be actually who will fall into this UBI category to start doing their own new thing. Like for example, I could as well become a full time sci fi writer if I didn't have a full-time job. So it's very much um, how you prioritize your time and what else you can do with this if you are given an opportunity. So yeah, lots of people <laughs> to come 
That makes a ton of sense. Um, let's talk about what I've uh, put here as the two massive mis missions of the 21st century, right? Uh, we have this reclamation project, which which is our planet, and we have this opportunity that Elon Musk and some others are, are, are pointing towards of um, visiting and maybe even establishing a colony on another planet. Let's talk about the first one first. And, and that's reclaiming our planet, uh, cleaning the ocean, um, finding ways to create enough food for enough people without stripping the ocean bare of all the fish that are in it, uh, cleaning our air. You talked about air and you talked about companies and maybe cities having air cleansing walls of, of some sort, um, uh, stations of some sort. That's something they could really use in India. I have a number of friends in India, in Delhi, for instance, and over the past months, they've had horrific air conditions, just horrible, like do not get outside and even inside. You are at risk of, of, of early death with just a little bit of exposure here. Um, we, we saw that in Sydney as well, right, with the wildfires that they had in Australia where their air quality was just horrific, absolutely horrific. Uh, let's talk about some of the jobs that you see coming out and, and the tasks that you see coming out mm -hmm. uh, for engineers to create, for, for people to implement uh, other things like that in restoring our environment? Yeah, uh, thank John for mentioning this uh, question. I think it's a truly very important mission because apart from uh, some obvious examples like uh, Beijing and New Delhi that you mentioned, we can really see the impact of uh, fires, natural or artificial, um, like whole Singapore is suffocating because of fires uh, in Philippines, in Indonesia, where, where they put uh, the, the tropical forest on fire to get more um, space for, um, uh, for, what is this? Uh, Farming? And no, 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 the, the trees, they, they put in Nutella, the, this thing. Oh, um, uh, chocolate or uh, chocolate trees or perhaps even rubber. Oh, yeah, rubber could be, but um, yeah, the, there is some special uh, oil as well, which is okay. like the worst type. Um, then the same, of course, in California, sometimes it's even in Europe. Uh, we definitely talk very little about Europe, but I used to live in uh, Krakow in Poland. It's a, it's a beautiful and uh, old city, very popular among tourists. But not everyone knows that it's one of the most heavily polluted cities in Europe and actually in the world. So I was checking sometimes the level of pollution when I was living there. Sometimes it was coming very close to Beijing and sometimes it was higher. The, um, our awareness of what is happening in our own backyard is unfortunately very low. And uh, I think as it becomes higher with the increase in the different groups like Extinction Rebellion here in UK, of course, Greta Thunberg uh, really contributed to this crucial um, tendency. We will see more and more people actually understanding the importance of preserving this very planet. And this is also what I'm advocating with uh, transhumanism and improvement of human species. Because in all fairness, there is absolutely no point living longer or even forever if you're going to uh, spend this life in a trash bin. And this is exactly what we are doing out of Earth today. So uh, it looks like capitalism as it is now, this with the short-term gains, is really is outliving itself. And we need to see the search of uh, professions that will take care of the earth to restore itself for new generations. For I think I'll be still fine more or less as a millennial, but um, like my children and my grandchildren will be absolutely screwed if we don't do something uh, in the next five, 10 years to create a new ecosystem. So you, you were mentioning ocean cleaning. This is crucial. Any type of engineering constructions that will be efficient in that is uh, very important. Even species preservation, we're talking about our health, the pollution and stuff like this, but we forget about six mass extinction of species and 
critical loss of biodiversity with about 1,000 species going extinct in a week. So, um, so far we are not noticing it too much, but maybe in 10 years when we are left only with domestic chickens, we'll start wondering. <laughs> so sure so it's very good to have people who are gathering genetic samples and who are recreating the species in, in labs or artificial environments. And this will be huge, huge new profession of the future. Um, biologists, marine biologists, recreations of corals. So, ma so much creativity can uh, be reestablished here. Like actually, just recently I read uh, about some new technique of the uh, sound uh, that they're putting next to uh, bleached coral reefs. Yes. With special, um, um, I don't know, like a special um, tone that can lure fish back in and start the whole ecosystem growing from the start. So. People just understood that uh, corals are dying. Even, even Great Barrier Reef is almost gone. And um, I think people are not, you know, doomed. I think we actually have something good in us. The population of uh, rhinos and uh, blue whales is coming back to norm just because there were specific um, restrictions in fishing, in poaching, and the only thing we have to do is increasing awareness and uh, telling people that it's important because I don't think that um, naturally we are bad. We just like to close eyes to many things. And if we are not given this chance, we can really help the planet. I think that um, um, we do need to open people's eyes to it, but I do think that many people's eyes are open to it. I think that what's missing is an economic imperative. We do have a capitalist system in most of the planet, um, even parts that, that aren't uh, nominally capitalist. And, and, and the challenge with that, and in a consumer society, is that it is hard to assign value uh, where there is no economic uh, current value. Like what is the Great Barrier Reef, reef worth? Obviously um, from any um, rational perspective, it's incalculable. You can't calculate the worth, right? It, it's, 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 it's precious beyond imagining. But when we fail to actually assign value to these things, then it's hard for us to assign new jobs of creating, preserving uh, biodiversity, uh, other things like that, and assign social value to that, that it comes with economic value as well. So we can actually create economic incentives for companies, for individuals, for people to work at the things that we need to work at to restore this planet to what it can be. Um, I think that that's something that we're, uh, people have tried to do with carbon credits, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that we need to extend that concept uh, even farther so that we see value in um, a startup that's trying to reduce the great garbage patch of the Pacific. And, and we assign uh, value to that. And, and then we also properly cost out, uh, if you're Coca-Cola and you're the largest plastic polluter on the planet <laughs> from from what we've heard recently we are not appropriately charging what it actually costs to produce and continue complete the life cycle of a plastic bottle what yeah, is it? You, you get 10 cents back when you return it um for for a deposit or something like that well should it be a dollar should it be two dollars? What is the actual cost to not just produce, but also to the environment um, of production and of recycling okay. or other things? Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Of disposing those uh, those things, those products, and recycling. Yeah, that's exactly very true. So I think part of how we can um, solve this issue is the societal pressure. And currently, already, uh, people are very often choosing environmentally friendly um, solutions, services, and products. So the problem with that is very often they're still more expensive than, uh, than cheap ones like Coca-Cola. Uh, so probably you would still go with cheap option if you're not a millionaire. 
Yeah, right. and I think that's the problem, right? Is that we can go with the cheap option because we don't appropriately cost out what something actually costs us environmentally through its entire life cycle. However, it looks like there are some companies uh, like um, uh, Elon Musk is creating the um, ro rooftops that uh, the solar rooftops that actually cost pretty much the same. And if we think about this, uh, solar power is um, so cheap if we understand how to properly um, uh, get the right percentage of solar energy because the sun in one hour gives more energy than we consume in a year so why are we not using solar panels on every house if yes. it's so much cheaper yes it's not even an economic issue it's all about lobbying and about people who are um making sure that we don't exactly let's turn our uh, attention then to the second uh, major job um, that that could create a lot of opportunity for jobs and for um, exploration um, which is this colonizing the solar system if we look down the line a little farther obviously this is not today but there are serious people with very serious technology who are very seriously looking at things like expanding where we can live uh, to the moon to mars uh, beyond how if you look at that how does that change the picture for humanity and jobs and, and your vision of of the kind of future that we'll have yeah that's definitely a very futuristic question and a very exciting one something that i was expecting for sure um to be fair, I think, again, it has a lot to do with um, economic benefit and the actual reason to go to space. So it's interesting to see how many um, discoveries and how many trips to, to space were happening when we had, um, you know, some kind of... Uh, uh, older man politics competition going on during the Cold War. That yes. Like a really good incentive to do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, as of now, I think uh, we are living in a more prosperous, market relaxed uh, climate when you are going to do something if it actually just makes sense. And um, thankfully, for the time being, Earth is still kind of livable. So um, I think we definitely should focus on preserving Earth and only some part of investments and uh, some, uh, you know, some new initiatives should go to uh, discovering new planets. However, that should always be our uh, plan B because just, again, from a pragmatic point of view, living on one planet as a species is not sustainable in case something happens the same as uh, happened to our poor dinosaurs, uh, distant relatives. Yes. That would be unfortunate. I mean, whatever. They, they... That would be unfortunate. Yes, it would. <laughs> Destruction of the human race. Slightly unfortunate. <laughs> the universe will definitely go on without us. There will be new species created. There will be new stuff happening. But um, as a humanist, and I do like our species quite a lot, I think we should at least uh, try to go to Mars. I think Moon is not very sustainable in terms of atmosphere creation. So um, definitely all the space barons, that's at the moment our best bet, because governments tend to be a bit stingy and conservative, as we see with uh, NASA lately. Um, so yeah, Elon, maybe China, China seems to be quite out there. Um, so I put a lot of hope on, um, entrepreneurship and dreamers because in the end of the day, dreamers are the people who create the future. Very true. Very true. Uh, I'm excited about a project that, uh, is to send a micro, uh, a micro spaceship or starship, I should say, to Alpha Centauri. Uh, it's it's a package, only you know maybe a kilogram or something like that, that they hope to accelerate via laser and send out you know within the next decade or so um, at a fairly significant fraction of the speed of light, which means that we could some artifact that a human being has created could be 
beyond our solar system um, and actually in not just in interstellar space as as, as we have a couple probes already doing that but actually visiting another star system that would be incredible and amazing i wanted to end this um this session with you kate on uh, some of your favorite science fiction. Um, every futurist that I know um, loves science fiction or, or has been deeply influenced by science fiction. I have as well. I've written a science fiction novel and uh, I wanted to ask uh, what science fiction has, has influenced you and what's been most interesting to you? Um, so... Um... I, I tend to use science fiction as an um, inspiration for mm -hmm. many thoughts to, to dream, to find um, another meaning in life because it really expands our horizons. And I was very lucky as a child when I was 11 or 12. My parents gave me some books. So I think they were very much into Ray Bradbury. So the first books that kind of big books that I read were the compilations of essays by Red Bradbury. It yes. was, of course, the classics of uh, 451 Fahrenheit um, yes. and Chronicles and lots of other essays where he mainly looks at the subjects of uh, space conquering as well as um, uh, upcoming robotization, as well as lots of things around VR and talking walls. So people like that, like Bradbury, Wells, uh, Stevenson, there are those that pretty much predicted uh, the, the phones, all the VR ecosystems, and so many things that we haven't even created yet. Yes. Yes. Who are you reading lately? Uh, so those some of those those are some of the great uh, old masters. Who are you reading lately? Oh, I've been pretty bad with my reading. I'm actually working, <laughs> I'm working on a book as well. Um, this is like oh. off um, off sci-fi, a little bit more into philosophy of tech and society, mm -hmm. touching on the freedom of of uh, thought. Okay. Uh, but uh, I tried reading um, uh, Peterson. Yes. Who I had quite mixed feelings previously because of his uh, various comments towards uh, women in the workplace, and I myself also had various experience in the workplace as well. But I do see a lot of um, good stuff and good reasons for checking out uh, alternative points of view. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, Bradbury's not a bad place to start and there's a lot to move on from there. Uh, I look forward to seeing your book um, and seeing what that looks like when it comes out. And thank you so much for spending this time with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, John. And hello everyone to Future 39. <laughs> excellent this will live on youtube and it will the podcast will go out as well wherever podcasts go uh, if you are listening on the podcast please give it a rating and a review especially if you like it anyways this is john goods here yeah. and future 39 thank you so much for spending some time with us thank, thank you, you very much doesn't matter which galaxy you're in give us a like <laughs> wonderful have a great day kate cheers you too Bye.